This is an interview of Noel Kinnaman. Uh, Noel Kinnaman and I have been uh, colleagues now for 22 years, I think, in the English department at Mars Hill. And um, I believe you're now senior member of the faculty, Noel. And how you've been here 43 years, isn't that right? 43. 43 yeah. years, Starting going on 44. 44. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's start by uh, let me ask you a little bit about your background and uh, what you did in the years before you came to Mars Hill. Yeah. I grew up in a small tobacco farming community near Winston-Salem, actually, it was closer to Kernersville. And my sister was the first member of the family who ever went to college. She went to Maryville College. And, um, and then I went to, after graduating from Glenn High School in Kernersville, I went to Duke University. Because I was not from a wealthy, privileged background, Duke University was very good for me. I was able to take full advantage of the, the opportunities I had there, and I had a first-class education. Entered there in 61, 1961. Got my A.B. in um, 1965, and then I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for my master's degree the next year. Um, and took the master's degree in 1966 <clears throat> in English. I always majored in English. Okay, so majored school. in English. Yeah. So you were a, a Duke graduate and a Carolina graduate. Yes, that always surprises my students, especially. <laughs> sure. They can't believe it. <laughs> that someone could actually hold those oh, two together yeah, in one career. They, they just never literally believe it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when did you first come to Mars Hill College? I came in uh, the summer of 1966. My, um, this, my uh, thesis director was also the director for Ed Cheek, who had come to Mars Hill in 1964, I think it was. <clears throat> and we had both worked with um, Dr. Bailey. And Dr. Bailey was still very much in touch with Ed. So Ed told him, that there was a position open in English. He told me I applied for the job and I was asked to come up for an interview. I think it was in the summer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm almost certain it was in the summer, maybe early summer. And I was interviewed by Dean Lee and Marsh Banks and then uh, he introduced me to uh, John McLeod, Mr. Mack, as we called him, mm -hmm. very fondly. <coughs> and um, Betty Hughes says that, uh, one, our retired colleague says that she was hired on the spot. <laughs> I don't remember that's what happened, mm -hmm. but um, I certainly was not interviewed by the whole department. I don't know what they would have said if they had known <laughs> I was being hired, but, uh, but I was. So, um, yeah, and then, and then I started teaching that, that fall. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a transition period, Dr. Blackwell. I did not meet him and was interviewed by him, and I think he had, um, he had retired, was planning to retire about that time. And he was the so president. He was the president at the time. So when you were interviewed, Dr. Blackwell was the president, That's but right. this was the transition right. year yeah. to uh, Fred Bentley's. Right, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Um, so this was your first, it was this your first and only interview? First and only job interview, first and only job <laughs> <laughs> for 43 years. So directly right. from graduate school. Right. Okay. Right. Well, there have probably been some personnel changes in the English department over all those years. Talk a little bit about, about some of those changes. Yes, um, I'll, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk about the major changes, um, the faculty members who were here for more than three or four years. <clears throat> when I came, <clears throat> there were seven, and I made eight. We're now only six. <laughs> We've actually so lost shrunk. two positions <laughs> in, in all those years. Um, the, the faculty members who were here then in the English department were John McLeod, Mr. Mack, his wife Mary, Betty Hughes, Ed Cheek, Mary Erig, and Paul Soles. And um, I actually shared an office in what is now Founders Hall. I think it was called the office building at the mm -hmm. time. It was the first building on the campus. 
<clears throat> and I shared an office with um, Paul Searles and Ed Cheek in Founders Hall, and it was in the area where Walt Stroud's office is now. Mm -hmm. Paul Searles and I, who were junior, shared a large open space, and Ed Cheek had a room to himself, which was sort of in the back of that uh, large space. Mm -hmm. um, that made um, having student conferences somewhat difficult. <laughs> But, but we, we obviously managed. I, I don't remember that it, it really caused any serious problems. And the Cornwall was first built is that the rooms, the classrooms had partitions. You know, the, the seminar rooms, mm -hmm. what we now call the seminar rooms, mm -hmm. they had accordion partitions. And classes were actually taught. So there would be two classes taught in one of those seminar rooms with a partition, with an accordion partition, you know, just a thin piece of plastic. And that sometimes did cause problems with uh, when students maybe were taking an examination in one part of the room mm -hmm. and you were trying to uh, lecture in the other. Mm -hmm. Kind of our um, version of the open classroom. So yeah, uh, yeah, which I did not like. <laughs> Nobody liked. That's why the petitions are no longer there. <laughs> okay. They weren't there very long. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was seen originally as a you know, efficiency, mm -hmm. a way of mm -hmm. using space more efficiently. Mm -hmm. but, um, we certainly didn't like it. Nobody did. <clears throat> and then um, from 87 to 97, there were some other changes in the faculty in each department. You were hired. Mm -hmm. Was it in 1987? 87. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so another milestone year. Um, and then Hal McDonald and Virginia Bauer um, mm -hmm. were hired during that time. And there were also some retirees during that period. Uh, Joe Schubert retired then, and uh, Pat Verhulst and Ed Cheek mm -hmm. retired. Um, but um, overall, the faculty has been fairly stable. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the attrition, um, th 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 there were people who were here for, for short, very short periods of time. But most of the faculty retired, mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of stability I think, in the department. The latest members of the department um, to be hired were Jason and Joanna Pierce, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think they represent uh, hope for the future stability and high quality of the department. Uh, I think they've been good additions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the other major changes um, has to do with where people chose to live. Because when I came in 66, Betty Hughes reminded me of this, by the way. She said that uh, new faculty members were strongly encouraged to live in Mars Hill. The administration, I think, actively discouraged people from living elsewhere at the time. But already, there were some changes. Uh, for instance, Betty Hughes lived in Weaverville mm -hmm. because her husband worked in, uh, in Asheville and they had already decided, when she was hired in 1965, they had already decided they were going to live in, uh, in Weaverville, but she was encouraged to live in Mars Hill. <clears throat> so I suppose actually I'm the last member of the department uh, to live uh, and remain in Mars Hill because mm -hmm. everybody else now lives elsewhere. You mm -hmm. live near Burnsville and um, some members of the faculty live in Asheville mm -hmm. and of course Weaverville. Mm -hmm. So you are the only member of the English department that lives I in am. I am. Built my house here. <laughs> and still live in that house that yeah. you built, right? Yeah, okay. that's about 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I mean, I was very, very young, very raw, very inexperienced. I didn't really think so much about those things. And since at that time, everybody except for Betty Hughes I believe, was living in Mars Hill. It just seemed natural, mm -hmm. and I didn't really give it any, any further mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. And when I built my house, I thought that I always wanted to live my life in an area more like this. I think now I'd prefer living in an urban environment. But, uh, but yes, th th certainly in terms of housing, things have changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. So you mentioned some changes in offices and classrooms. Um, are there other changes in the facilities uh, that have to do with uh, teaching that have affected the way people teach? Yes, yes. Um, so 
originally my classes were, because my office was in uh, Founders Hall, there were no classroom spaces in Founders Hall, we taught our classes in other buildings. So for instance, um, Wall, the, mm -hmm. uh, my, my first classes were in the basement, the, the lower floor of Wall um, Science Building. I had one in Chambers Gym, mm -hmm. and uh, we did have classroom spaces in uh, McConnell which was the, where our offices were in the early 70s. But uh, the major change, I think, the most important change for me personally, I think generally for the college as a whole, has been the infusion of computer technology. <coughs> um, that's been um, a, a, a sweeping change, a very major change um, for all of us and certainly for me. I mean, I think when I think back to what I was doing in 1966, we, of course, nobody dreamed of computers, certainly not personal computers. Right. Um, computers had been invented by then, but uh, I don't think I ever would have expected to be using a computer. You had an electric typewriter, you were lucky. Yeah, exactly, precisely, <laughs> yeah. precisely. And um, we did, um, we did have, we were given by the college, um, manual typewriters, mm -hmm. and that was a great convenience, so, uh, but to prepare multiple copies of things, we had to use mimeograph machines, mm -hmm. or what we used to call the old ditto machine. Ditto machine, machine I remember that. Ditto had mm -hmm. purple ink. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it could make a huge mess. <laughs> yes, yes, and we did most of that ourselves. Mm -hmm. There were members of the staff who did the mimeographing, but uh, I, I remember doing a lot of, uh, a lot of mimeographing. Mm -hmm. um, but but we did have the we did have the the typewriters which helped a great deal. Um, but it was in the eighties that um, we first saw the use of computers. Uh, Joe Schubert had a student named Bob Balance who bought a PC Junior. This was a, it literally was the first personal computer available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Big clunker of a machine, mm -hmm. you know. But um, Bob Ballas was an English major and uh, a very good one, a uh, very good student. Uh, mature, he was older, a bit older than other students. And he, uh, Joe Schubert's memory is that he himself bought a PC Junior to use mm -hmm. for himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Schubert quickly saw that that was uh, something that we could use in the department. So mm -hmm. he was able to get the college to purchase three. Gerald Ball helped me remember there were three. I thought there were just two, but there were three PC Juniors for the department. And they were installed in what I think we call the writing lab, which was up in the second floor of Marsh Banks. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't used, I, to, I, I can't remember exactly how they were used at the time because we certainly didn't uh, use them in class, but, uh, but I definitely remember using them and Joe Schubert used them. I think we were the, the main ones to mm -hmm. use them, except when Kay Gregory was a student and was hired here. And um, she used them, I think, to a great degree with, um, the, with basic writing. Mm -hmm. So you did use them with students? We did, mm -hmm. we did. But not right. in class, right? Not in class, right, not in class, but they were used. I think that's why we're in the writing lab. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my sister was teaching at Chowan College at the time, oh. and she was also beginning to learn about computers, and she actually wrote an article about how computers can help with uh, basic writers. Mm -hmm. I don't remember why exactly now, but it had something to do with their not having to depend on pen and paper. It was something about the use of the computer that, that freed them up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that may be one reason also that, that Kay Gregory uh, used the computers in that. And it may be one reason why they were installed there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, eventually, of course, the, um, the business department actually had the first computer lab. Mm -hmm. And that was on the main floor of Marsh Banks. You've helped me remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, and other, I, th I think eventually classes from other departments began to reserve that space. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the way we sort of began to see even more clearly how computers could be used for, for teaching. I remember that space was yeah. organized so that the computers were in a row and yes. the teacher had very little <laughs> space at the front to, to stand and then the computers are just kind of in a row. Right. And right. the reason I'll ask you that is because later it changed and, and I'll let you tell about that. Yes, in a major way. Yeah, that, um, that configuration with computers in rows is what we call the computer lab. And <laughs> I still don't like using that term because um, when this space, uh, we're in Renfro uh, mm -hmm. Library, this was originally the cafeteria, as, as you know. Did you, were you here when it was a cafeteria? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> and um, when they got money to build a new library, I mean a, a new cafeteria, they decided that this would become the library. The mm -hmm. library was originally in uh, what we now call Memorial Hall because it was called well, it was Memorial Hall for a while. It was Memorial Library. It's right. now Nash. Now, now Nash, um, Nash right. Education mm -hmm. Building. And um, so when this was renovated as a library, we were allowed to think of this space that we're in now, in the upper, uh, the, the second floor of uh, what, we, what is now Renfrew Library. We were allowed to think of this as a classroom space where we were going to put computers. And there was a Title III grant. Did you help write the Title III grant? No. No? No, I didn't. I but I remember, that, I remember it yeah. being. That was something else you reminded me of. So somebody wrote a Title III grant that helped us fund this space as a writing classroom. Not a writing lab, <laughs> a writing mm -hmm. classroom. And the reason I use that term is that while we were thinking about renovating this space, we were allowed to take a field trip. We went to uh, Ohio Dominican College in Columbus, Ohio, and we spoke with a woman who had helped design a computer classroom for composition. She took us there. There wasn't a class uh, meeting there because it was in the summer, I believe. Mm -hmm. But she showed us how it was used. And just from her demonstration, I suddenly saw that that would work for me. Mm -hmm. Using the computer in the classroom would transform the way I could teach composition. And, and it did. I mean, mm -hmm. that was a, a completely transformative mm -hmm. experience for me. And since then, I have, oh, and of course, th this was our first computer classroom. The space that we're this in right space, now. right. And, and describe, how is it a classroom as opposed to a lab? Ah, <laughs> good, <laughs> good point. Thank you. <laughs> it's a classroom because the, the um, computers, the, the, the students' workstations, are displayed around the wall. Mm -hmm. Now, there are lots of advantages to that for teaching composition. For one thing, the teacher is not, well, the students are not boxed in in rows. Mm -hmm. which, which makes it difficult for teachers to interact with the students. So when the computer workstations are, are configured around the walls, then the teacher can interact with the students, um, can actually go up to the students, which is what I saw that, uh, I wish I should have looked up her name <laughs> because she had a strong influence on me. Mm -hmm. But that's what we saw that woman in Ohio do. We saw her actually kneel down <laughs> by a computer as if she were interacting with a student. You can't do that if the computers are in rows. So that's one thing. Um, of course, um, it's also easier for the teacher to see what is on the screens, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that can sometimes help keep the students on task. Um, but the other advantage a major advantage of having the computers configured around the walls is that you have this space in the middle. And so you can bring, um, you can have uh, tables, uh, we do have tables in this room, um, where you can bring the students together, you can get them away from the computers and get them together for discussion or for other kinds of class activities. Um, now, when did we when did we start using Renfro A and B, 133, 134? Mm, that was a few years after this was put yeah, into, yeah. it was our major room right. and we started using right. those. Those rooms are very small, mm -hmm. very narrow. Mm -hmm. 
but I can still work with them because what's most important for me is the interaction with the students at the at the workstations because <clears throat> I I don't think everybody would uh, approve of this <laughs> but I have a lot of papers done in class mm -hmm. in the multiple stages because I think that really works for me mm -hmm. um, I, I have a lot of interaction with the students. I think that I can do a lot of teaching when I'm interacting with the students while they're engaged in the process of writing at the computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I have more success doing it that way. So you're writing l classes that are more like workshops and you they actually really have are. students doing really their are. work in they the really class. Are. They really are. And how much do you use the overhead projector so that you're ah. projecting things onto the screen in front of the class? I do use that quite a lot. Um, now I, I may say before that that, um, that even though we don't have this central area where students can gather, I just have them turn around. <laughs> So I, they don't spend all their time on the computers because we have some discussion of homework assignments, for instance, if they're reading, or those days when I lecture, <laughs> then um, I have them turn their chairs around and face me and one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that also leads me to talking about um, my use of the projector and the screen and my use of uh, internet technology otherwise because I, I create web pages for all my composition classes. Mm -hmm. And the value of that for me is that, again, it, it enhances the interactive uh, approach to teaching composition because I can display the web pages on the, the screen mm -hmm. at the front of the room, but the students can also access them themselves mm -hmm. at the computers. And so I've created, I, I put my syllabi online so students can can use that for um, finding out about class assignments and that sort of thing. But I also create web pages with links that students can access in class mm -hmm. at their workstations. And I do that for exercises. I do it for uh, group discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I do it for instruction as well. So some of my I teach grammar and sentence structure by use of a web page, mm -hmm. which has links on it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the, the web pages are interactive, so mm -hmm. it'll send students to, uh, for instance, I have um, one web page which introduces the students to the, um, to the parts of speech, but also to the function of the parts of speech in the sentence. And I have, uh, some questions that they're supposed to ask about sentences. And then there are links to the answers mm -hmm. so they can check themselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they can go back and mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. at the sentence to see whether they're correct or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's how but I But you've it. also used web pages in your literature classes. For example, your Shakespeare class. Yeah, that's, that was one of the uh, first ones, wasn't it? It was, mm -hmm. exactly. I didn't start uh, creating the pages for the composition classes until I'd actually done the Shakespeare page. So you were talking about your Shakespeare page. Yes. Um, one of the difficulties in teaching Shakespeare is that students don't have a sense, most people would not have a sense of the way plays were performed in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they don't have a sense of the space Shakespeare had in mind when he was actually writing the plays. So I would say within the past 10 years or so, there's been a new Globe Theater built in, uh, mm -hmm. on Bankside in, in London. And it very well replicates what we imagine an Elizabethan theater would look like because mm -hmm. they don't they haven't survived. Mm -hmm. There are some images, uh, some paintings and, uh, and uh, drawings of some of those early theaters. Mm -hmm. So this right. has been reconstructed. It's been reconstructed, mm -hmm. right? It's been reconstructed. And I was able to see some plays there a few years ago, and I. I don't usually like taking photographs, but I had a disposable camera with me, so I took some photographs, mm -hmm. uh, both inside and outside the globe, because they didn't, I, I think they discouraged you from taking photographs during a performance, mm -hmm. but you could take uh, photographs before or in intermission. 
or the interval as they say. So I made some photographs of the globe, both inside and out. And the next time I taught my Shakespeare course, I decided that I would try to help the students get a sense of the material features of the acting space for which Shakespeare wrote by creating another one of these interactive uh, web pages. So I used my photographs and um, created some links also to some, some lectures or some essays about the, the theater mm -hmm. and about how it was used mm -hmm. and what the conditions were like. And so that's what I do the first night or on the first the class, first class period, period. When, I, when I teach Shakespeare. I, I use that to introduce the students to the, so they can get a sense of, of how the plays are actually shaped by the theater for mm -hmm. which they've written. It, it really makes a big difference mm -hmm. when you see it that mm -hmm. way and it explains mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. about the way the Shakespeare's plays are very fluid. Mm -hmm. There really were no act and scene divisions in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, those were added later by 18th century editors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and Shakespeare wouldn't have had a curtain, so mm -hmm. there was no way to stop the action. The action yeah, was really okay. continuous, and that's explained partly by the fact that there was no curtain mm -hmm. uh, in the mm -hmm. open Elizabethan stage. Mm -hmm. And then um, I also got the idea of having the students create their own web pages mm -hmm. as final projects, mm -hmm. and that worked really well. Mm -hmm. uh, can't do that anymore though because they've taken off the uh, software that I used. But I think it helped the students a great deal. It also helped them develop a skill that many of yeah. the the English education students, for instance, really were appreciated. Able to use. Yeah. yeah, I remember some of the students talking about creating those early web pages on the, in yeah. the Shakespeare class. It was like the first time they had they yes. had done that kind yes. of thing. Of course, yes. now they do it. Routinely, I guess, yeah. uh, in different ways. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. Well, that reminds me also that you know, I think Mars Hill was on the cutting edge um, <laughs> in, in, in a small way. Uh -huh. Because this was only, I don't think I mentioned the date earlier, this was only around 1983 or so when we got those PC juniors. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the other important point that perhaps could be made about our use of computers now is that um, all of our composition courses are, are taught. taught mm -hmm in computer mm -hmm. spaces, mm -hmm. and universities can't say that. That's true. Many, That's many true. colleges yeah. can't say that. So sometimes you think that being a small college is a disadvantage, but in fact, in terms of technology here, at least teaching technology, it's been, we've been fairly, as you say, on the cutting edge, or oh, I, at I least agree. near it. Oh, I right. agree with you. Well, how have students, how their ability with computers, how have you noticed the oh. changes in that? <laughs> well. Yes. I mean, there was a time when I could instruct the students, <laughs> but now um, they are so sophisticated mm -hmm. in their use of uh, computer technology mm -hmm. and the internet and everything else. Mm -hmm. The cell phones, mm -hmm. you know, for instance. I, right. I only got my cell phone a year ago. Um, they now often teach me. That's another way, though, that, that I find the computer classroom interactive, because I've learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, from students about the use mm -hmm. of the computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, each other, they teach each other They do, things. they right. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that can help a great deal. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah when, when things seem to go wrong and a student will say, oh, have you tried that? Or let me show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, and I think I think they're very comfortable with the use of, the, almost all students now are very comfortable using the computer in the, mm -hmm. in the composition classroom. And it's easy to revise, make multiple drafts. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think of back when we used to do papers as graduate students and yeah. doing another, a revision would, was like a major, another major paper. Exactly. So, yeah. And you had to retype the mm -hmm. whole thing. Right. Or try to erase, but that yeah. was as much a chore sometimes as mm -hmm. retyping the whole paper. Mm -hmm. So um, your current and your former students and your colleagues know quite a bit, I think, about, about your uh, accomplishments as a as a teacher and uh, just the fact that you have sort of stayed current with technology and, and used it, employed it in your teaching um, speaks, speaks, I think, uh, about, about your commitment to teaching mm -hmm. and to the changes in teaching. But you have another whole life that I think many of your, even your closest colleagues don't always know about and that's your scholarship, that's your research. Mm -hmm. 
which you have managed better than I think anybody at Mars Hill to keep going over the years. So talk a little bit about this research that you have that you've engaged in and when you started it and what it what it's like. Mm -hmm. Well, it has been a really important part of my life, um, and being at Mars Hill has, in a sense, been an advantage in that I don't have to fear perishing if I don't publish, mm -hmm. and so that's taken a lot of the pressure off. Mm -hmm. Everything I've done, um, in a scholarly sense, has been done because I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. It's been. It's been a labor of love in many ways because, of course, you don't make money. I know. <laughs> True. Um, um, I did some research before 1987, but um, that was uh, really the year that I think my, you could say, my scholarly career started because I won uh, an NEH summer stipend that year. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually started working on the project that eventually became my first book. Um, but I, now I did have um, a James Still Fellowship through the ACA at the University of Kentucky before that. Um, and that both those projects were related. So, my, but, but the NEH was the first major uh, sort of foray mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. uh, the scholarly world in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, do you and remember the year of that first? It was 1987. 87. Yeah, 87 okay. was the first NEH uh, mm -hmm. stipend. Mm -hmm. I guess another reason for highlighting that is that I've had some others as well. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Some other NEH awards. Um, but that first um, publication was um, an edition of the collected works of Mary Sidney Herbert, Countess of Pembroke. The Countess of Pembroke was the most important non-royal woman writer of the period. And she's become very important now. She's become a canonical figure. Mm -hmm. But her works were available only piecemeal and in not very reliable editions. Mm -hmm. So I made contact with Oh, it was when I was applying for the NEH grant. You have to, of course, get uh, high-powered people to write mm -hmm. letters of reference for you. So I wrote to Margaret Henne, who had just written a biography of Mary Sidney called Philip, Phillips Phoenix. You didn't know her at the time? I did not know her, uh -huh. no. And um, she was reluctant to support my application for a grant until I met with her personally. Uh -huh. and she lived in upstate New York and I okay. lived in Mars Hill. She okay. suggested meeting halfway. What that meant was meeting halfway between Binghamton, New York and Albany, New York because <laughs> because my at, fortunately at the time I had a cousin who uh -huh. lived in Binghamton uh -huh. and so I said uh, well I'll, um, I, I'm going to go visit my cousin, so we'll meet halfway. So, mm -hmm. so we met halfway between Binghamton and mm -hmm. Albany at a, mm -hmm. a little inn where there was an interesting restaurant, so we had a nice meal there. So we talked, and uh, I mean, I don't blame her, really. I mean, I think you probably should ideally meet someone mm -hmm. personally whom you're mm -hmm. going to do a major mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. with. So after that meal, she said, well, Noel, I think we're going to do this. So that that's really what started it. Okay. I mean, my whole but now, what career. were your credentials up to then? I mean, you were, you oh. you were not published, and so she was. And why did she think that you were the person she wanted to do this? Yes. With? Well, I'd done my dissertation okay. on um, the Sydney Psalms. Mm -hmm. That is the 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 really most important work of Mary Sydney Herbert, which she did with her brother. Now, her brother start, Her brother was uh, Sir Philip Sydney, who mm -hmm. was. Um, mm -hmm the most important um, noble writer of the period anyway. Um, the, the Elizabethans would have seen him as the most important because he was, he was a public figure. Mm -hmm. um, he was considered to be the, the great hope of the Protestant cause, in fact. So he, he was really, I think, the most important writer of the time. Uh, Shakespeare was very popular, Edmund Spencer were very popular, but they weren't as public figures mm -hmm. as Sir Philip Sidney was. So um, he wrote um, Petrarchan sonnets. He wrote uh, an important prose romance called Arcadia. But shortly before his death, um, he started 
writing metrical versions of the Psalms. So in other words, he started um, translating, which people these days still prefer to use. I don't like the word translation, but <laughs> he started translating the biblical Psalms into English verse. He did 43 of them mm -hmm. uh, before his death. And after his death, his sister, Mary Sidney, who by that time was married, and um, so her married name was Herbert, but her, her husband was Earl of Pembroke, so she became Countess of Pembroke. She completed this project. So she wrote the rest of them. I forgot what the number would be. Um, the other 150 or the, the others after 43. And there are really many remarkable things about that. First of all, it was an early modern woman mm -hmm. who did it. Mm -hmm. And she took a very scholarly approach to it because she, she knew Latin, mm -hmm. she knew French, she knew Italian. And we know from studying the sources of the Psalms that she studied various versions, not just in English, but in Latin. Mm -hmm. I was the one who discovered that she, uh, that she studied a, a Latin version, and one of my uh, first articles was, mm -hmm. was on that. Mm -hmm. um, another remarkable thing about that, uh, that uh, metrical Psalter is that she didn't repeat verse forms, except maybe three or four times. So each one of her metrical Psalms is in a different verse form. Wow. And she invented some of them. Okay. And people now generally agree that her psalms are better than her brother's, even uh, though Sir Philip Sidney He was the one that was known. <coughs> right. Mm -hmm. So, so um, Margaret Hannay knew about my dissertation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so my dissertation was a study of the manuscripts of the psalms. There are 17 manuscripts of the psalms. And you see, this is, uh, that means that there are at least 150 different poems mm -hmm. in each of these um, manuscripts. <clears throat> so for my dissertation, I had actually collated all 17 of the Psalms, all 17 manuscripts. Another one has been discovered since then. And I'd also studied the verse, mm -hmm. and she knew about that. So she knew that I knew my subject, and, um, and, she also knew some other people who knew me. Right. But she also knew that <laughs> so, you were willing to drive all the way to, to New York yes, and meet with her personally. Exactly. So, okay. She was she knew that I was willing to, to take that and make that so commitment. You were serious about exactly. this. I was mm -hmm. serious about it. So um, our first plan was to prepare an edition of the Sydney Psalms, mm -hmm. which I'll come back to a little bit later. Okay. But um, or, or, or maybe just hers. I, I guess, no, at the time, we were, we were planning just to edit Mary Sidney's uh, Metrical Psalm. But um, we started looking for a publisher, and we uh, made contact with Oxford. But Oxford was a little bit reluctant at the time just to publish uh, an edition of Mary, Serber, uh, Mary, uh, Her Mary Sidney Herbert's Psalms. So they suggested a collected works we still felt a bit uncomfortable that we would be able to land that contract. So we asked uh, Michael Brennan, who now teaches at the University of Leeds and who has degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge, and who had published on the Sydneys mm -hmm. by, by that time. We asked him if he would join us. And he said yes. And we got a contract from Oxford. <laughs> ah, so there were the three of you. The three of us. And Oxford said, yes, this will work. Exactly. Okay. Right. So. Um, so he joined the team, and we got the contract. We, almost all of our publications, except for one, has been accepted for publication on the basis of a proposal. We've not had to complete <laughs> the project, and that, that's, that's unusual. That takes a lot of the pressure yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so we did that. We, complete, we prepared an edition of all of Mary Sidney Herbert's works, which included not just those psalms, mm -hmm. but a couple of prose translations, some original verse, and um, the the non Psalms work were published in one volume. The Psalms are published in another volume. Um, while we were doing that, we discovered that, or Margaret already knew this, and I was beginning to understand it at the time. But uh, we we had sort of brought home to us the fact that the Sydney papers 
are all collected at Maidstone in the Center for Kentish Studies, which is south of London. It's the county seat of Kent. Well, it turns out to be a gold mine. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of documents um, belonging to the Sydney family. Mm -hmm. Everything from accounts, mm -hmm. uh, financial accounts and little fragments, to the Sydney Psalter, the Penshurst uh, version of the Sydney Psalms, which has gilt ah. lettering. and mm -hmm. uh, It's so beloved by the, uh, the, the, the owner, who is a member of the Sydney family now, that he keeps it home. All the other Sydney papers are at the Center for Kentish Studies, but he keeps that, uh, that, that beautiful and beautifully written Psalter at home. Um, so we, we knew that all that material was there, and it includes letters, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of letters written by members of the Sydney family. And I had no idea what we were getting into at the time, <laughs> but of course we published some, we included some of Mary Sydney Herbert's letters in the edition, the collected edition of her works. But um, Margaret said, why don't we edit the letters of their brother? So there was Sir Philip Sidney, Mary Sidney Herbert. They had a brother, uh, Robert Sidney. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the letters there are his. Mm. And there are so many of them that they fall into groups um, based on to whom he was writing. Mm -hmm. So um, our first project was an edition of the letters that he wrote to his wife when he was on the continent because he he was uh, given the job by um, Queen Elizabeth to serve as the governor of a town in Holland that was, a, that was sort of being protected by the English. Mm -hmm. And so he was away for years at a time. And he would write letters to her. Mm -hmm. And those letters have survived through the uh, Center for Kentish Studies in, in Maidstone. And what's really important about those letters is that it, it reveals a, a great deal of information about a woman's role, about the role of a wife, and it turns out to be major because mm. she, she had responsibility for running the estate while he was away. Mm -hmm. And it's clear in his letters to her that he was giving her that responsibility. Now they would talk about things, and they argued even. <laughs> it's pretty in clear. their letters. Oh, oh. well, it, it, it was clear. We don't have hers to him. Okay. But uh, he would he would apologize to her <laughs> in a couple of cases, and uh, and and it was clear that he often took her took her advice. Mm -hmm. um, but she of course had to rear the children. Mm -hmm. And how many children did they have? Oh. Um, Lots and many of them died, oh. which was uh, mm -hmm. which was typical of the period. I don't remember the number uh, of surviving children, um, four mm -hmm. maybe four or five. Uh, but she, of course, would have been responsible for not only for, for their education, for their daily lives, but she helped with uh, finding husbands for the daughters, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, wives for the husbands. Um, so, so then we edited those letters. Mm -hmm. Those were published by Ashgate in mm -hmm. England, which is a, a, a major, a lot of people in America would not know about them, but uh, Ashgate publishes a lot of scholarly work based on study of the early modern period. <clears throat> so that was, um, that was a major and, and really important uh, edition and, and one that we, we all really enjoyed a great deal. I enjoy just reading those letters. They're absolutely fascinating. Partly because you know you're listening in on somebody else's life. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. Robert Sidney would never have expected that, that someone uh, somebody in living the in Mars 20th, Hill in the 21st, 21st century, century would know would anything about these letters. letters. You know, and the other thing that's so exciting about that is that you're handling them. Mm -hmm. you know, Something you that someone's actually actual written. Documents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that somebody wrote and, and sent to his wife, mm -hmm. and in some cases really did not expect to be read because mm -hmm. in the 16th century you had to be careful. Letters could be intercepted, and you had to be really careful about what you wrote because mm -hmm. people lost their heads <laughs> <laughs> uh, for just suspicion of treachery uh -huh. and that sort right. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I've really gotten a bit ahead though mm -hmm. because that was not my first. <laughs> Shall I back up a little sure. bit? Sure. Talk about <laughs> sure. Fill in the blanks. Yeah, I, I I I better back up uh, because I I I did something before that that I really enjoyed a lot and has meant a lot to me and, and was really another major achievement in some ways. 
and, and will surprise people. Um, before we actually edited the, um, the works of Mary Sidney Council uh, Pembroke, well, I was actually probably working on that project. I, of course, was the textual editor, which meant that I was responsible for um, making sure that we had the best text available of each of the works. And if you have 17 manuscripts of the Psalms, then you have to decide which one of those which one is the you're best. going to print. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing all that textual work, I began to, when I, I had to look up words. And where do you get to look up words uh, mm -hmm. from the literature written in the early modern period? The OED, OED the Oxford of English Dictionary. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I frequently had to go to the Oxford English Dictionary to check the meanings of words. Some that were literally you know, unfamiliar to me, but also to check about what a word might mean in a particular context. Mm -hmm. So as I was doing that, I noticed some errors. <laughs> In the OED? At, in the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote to tell them about it. And they decided that, well, the, actually the OED was in process of being revised at this time. They were actually planning ahead because this would have been, what, 19, early 1990s, mid-1990s? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were already thinking about preparing an online edition of the OED. And they asked me if I would help revise the, uh, the dictionary by verifying quotations, because that's what's really remarkable about the Oxford English Dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary is an historical dictionary. And what that means is that they include quotations illustrating the how use. the words are mm -hmm. used throughout history. Mm -hmm. And they had included quotations from Mary Sidney. Of course. Um, and so they asked me if I would verify the quotations from her works um, that were in the OED. I did that. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. And then they were pleased with that work, and I enjoyed doing it. And they asked me to, to verify uh, works from her brothers, or uh, verify quotations from her brothers' works, which included, I think it was, I know it was the Arcadia. Oh, it was the Arcadia and the Defense of Poetry, mm -hmm. a critical essay mm -hmm. that he wrote. So I agreed to do that. Then there were many more hundred, I'd say a thousand at least, wow. of those. And when I finished that, they asked me to verify quotations from The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. That meant 4,000 quotations. So I had to verify, that took, that took, in fact, I won a grant to help me. To help you do that. <laughs> right, so I went on leave to, uh, that was, it was not a sabbatical, it was a, um, uh, I, I just took some time off to do that project. Uh, so, so I did that, and of course, I was not offered any pay for that. I did it all for free. Mm -hmm. But I'm thanked at the website. The OED has been gracious enough to thank me for all that, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, hard labor, <laughs> which I enjoyed a lot. So if I go to the OED, <laughs> I can find your name there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to search for it. But yeah, if you go to the OED mm -hmm. online, you will find the mm -hmm. name there. And it says Mars Hill College next to it. I think it does. Oh. I think it does. I haven't checked it in a long time, but Good. I think it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, so then um, that, that was sort of a, a little project I did while I was doing all this other work. Right. <laughs> Um, well, uh, yeah. just for, pause for a second. Sure. So that must mean you really like detail work. Oh, I do. You, you like getting <laughs> things do. exactly right. Because what you were I doing do. was verifying, each time it was used as an example, you were yeah. verifying that this was an accurate example. Yes. And it, in fact, came from a certain edition of a certain yes. piece. Exactly. Okay. And frequently it did. And there were lots and lots of errors. So there were lots of errors. <laughs> oh, lots and had. lots of errors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes quotations that weren't even from the works that they <laughs> claimed to be from. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. there weren't quite so many of those, mm -hmm. but yeah, there were, there were errors. Okay. Yeah. So you were doing all that work at the same time that you were continuing on, and, but some of the time, most of the time you were teaching oh, as yes. well. Oh, yes. It was just oh, yeah. I was teaching at overload right. in most cases. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, right. All right. Oh. So pick the story back okay, up. Okay. So, um, so that, um, so that was um, two books then. So we did the uh, the Oxford edition of. Uh, by the way, that was reviewed on the front page of the uh, Literary Times Review. Or T Times Literary Review. The Times Literary yes, Review said that this edition should be greeted with trumpets and champagne. Ah! <laughs> and did you get any trumpets and champagne? No trumpets, <laughs> but um, we <laughs> certainly enjoyed we, celebrating. We need to work on the trumpets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
so so the and and then we did the um, the addition of the letters of uh, uh, Robert Sidney to his wife. Another work that I did with um, another book that I did with my English collaborator Michael Brennan is a chronology of the Sidney family. This is a reference work. Mm -hmm. And he actually did most of that, but he used my work on the letters. Oh, I, I guess I could have mentioned there are thousands and thousands of letters of Robert Sidney. And I've, I've completed a catalog mm. of those letters. Mm. And you've so read every one of them? I've read every single one of and them. And what's his handwriting like? Because uh, he didn't have a computer, I know that. <laughs> uh, no, he did not. Uh -huh. um, most scholars complain about his hand. Even Queen Elizabeth complained about his hand. This is Queen Elizabeth I. Queen course. Elizabeth I. Yes. Queen Elizabeth I, right. Mm -hmm. She told um, him that he needed to either learn to write better or have people write letters for him. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. But he didn't have a secretary. He did, of course, he was writing to his wife most well, of these. He, did, he would have a secretary, but personal letters, like mm -hmm. domestic letters like that, would not have been written by a secretary. Mm -hmm. Some of his letters to Queen Elizabeth were later written by a uh -huh. scribe, but, uh -huh. uh, but he still wrote some of them to her himself. Mm -hmm. Of course, she could do it. She just, in fact, she said in one letter, um, she said, um, I had to pause at only one or two places. <laughs> so she was able to read it. It was just uh -huh. not as easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, but a lot of modern scholars complain about his handwriting. They say his handwriting is very difficult to read. When you spend a lot of time with it, you can crack it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I like hearing people say that his handwriting is <laughs> it was hard difficult. To read. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so so then I did this catalog of um, I think over three thousand letters. Mm -hmm. I've read every one of them. I've transcribed every one of them. I've transcribed a lot of the letters written to him. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that, oh, I'm sorry, I should have clarified. That 3,000 includes not only the letters he wrote, but the letters but written to written him. To him. Mm -hmm. But that's still, you see, that's a, that's a remarkable resource of for course. history, mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for biography, for, for literary criticism, mm -hmm. even, mm -hmm. for, for literary scholarship, a remarkable resource. So um, our next project, was the, and, and that's the one that, that has just gone to press. Mm -hmm. That will make our fifth book. Oh, I, what I forgot to mention, another, another edition I forgot to mention is that we prepared a paperback edition of the works of Mary Sidney Herbert called the Selected Works of Mary Sidney Herbert mm -hmm. uh, Council Pembroke for student use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but because there are so many of these letters, in the Robert Sidney collection. Our next project was an edition of the letters of Robert and Bar his name is Barbara. Robert Sidney's uh, the first Earl of Leicester's uh, wife's name Barbara. So we have the letters of uh, Barbara and Robert Sidney's daughter-in-law to their son. Her name was uh, uh, Dorothy Percy and she married the Sydney son, who was confusingly named Robert. Mm. So uh, uh, her letters uh, to, to their son have survived, and we've just finished editing. Actually, we, we edited all of, her, all of the letters in her correspondence, which means that we were able to include the letters that she wrote to him and the letters that were written to her. Mm -hmm. And that's even more interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's particularly fascinating about these two projects is that they complement one another. Mm. Since Robert Sidney's letters to his wife survive, but her letters to him didn't survive. Mm -hmm. And we have um, their daughter-in-law's letters to their son. You get a sense of what the other side of the conversation was like uh -huh. in both cases. Now, of course, not exactly alike, but right. still... You read between some, the lines and you can figure yeah, out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the, in the early modern period, since in some ways marriage and the relationship between a husband and wife would have been similar, mm -hmm. then there are some ways in which you can sort of see that these two editions of the letters are complementary. I think people are going to find that interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and her letters are just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And this edition will include some letters from her sister. And they make a fascinating pair. There's an, a, a biography, a dual biography of them called country wife and courtly, country wife and court wife, I think it is, uh -huh. because they were polar opposites. Oh, I see. And you get a sense of that in their letters. They're uh -huh. absolutely fascinating. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that just went to press, 
and that will be coming out in September. And who's publishing that? Ashgate. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The actually, there's another book that has already that went to press earlier. That is our, I guess that's our fourth. The letters of Dorothy Percy Sidney is our fifth. <coughs> No, that's their sixth. Right. The, the, so, the, so the, the one that's the, being published now is their sixth. Right. The mm -hmm. the edition, the, the this other edition of the letters is the sixth one. The fifth one is a new edition of the complete Sydney Psalms. Mm -hmm. So this will include all the Psalms, metrical Psalms written by Philip Sidney and Mary Sidney. It's the first mm -hmm. complete edition, the first scholarly edition. Mm -hmm. And it's being published by Oxford again. That's why I said earlier that we'd come back to that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was what Margaret and I were going to do originally. At least we were going to publish just uh, Mary Sidney's Psalms. But now we've just edited all of the Psalms by mm -hmm. Philip Sidney and Mary Sidney. We had a fourth collaborator for that. And that was uh, Hannibal Hamlin, who teaches at uh, Ohio University, mm -hmm. I think. And we brought him on board because he wrote a remarkable book called um, Psalm Culture in the 16th century, because these metrical psalms were very popular in mm -hmm. the 16th century, mm -hmm. 16th and 17th centuries. Um, lots of people wrote them. Mm -hmm. They were used in the church. I mean, certain mm -hmm. versions of them mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. Just everybody was, uh, was writing psalms. <clears throat> so we think that's really going to be a major uh, addition mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. complete. Well, it sounds like one project leads to another project. Yeah, that's exactly so what has happened. Really, that's yeah. exactly what has happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, but it's it's partly because of the, this just just astounding uh, jewel of a collection mm -hmm. of papers in in Maidstone. I mean, it's just a mm -hmm. remarkable right. set of documents. And you've actually there. met members of the family uh, to to get access to this. No, collection? I haven't actually met him. Margaret and Michael have. Lord Delisle, mm -hmm. who is a descendant of the, uh, the Sydney family, his name is Philip, uh -huh. Philip Sidney. And his son is Philip Sidney. His, his son has uh, just got a degree um, from Oxford, I think, but he's, uh, he's gone to graduate school at Cambridge. I've not met him, but I've corresponded with him, and I've corresponded with his father. His father, uh, was, who was Lord Delisle, was Governor General of Australia. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both uh, understand the value of the collection. They understand mm -hmm. how important it is. Mm -hmm. But they also understand the need to protect it. So they don't let just anybody see it. I must say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Margaret and Michael and I are among the few people in the world who have been given almost carte blanche uh, mm -hmm. access to that collection. We do still have to write periodically and ask for renewal of mm -hmm. permission. But mm -hmm. Uh, the current Lord Delisle calls us the learned triumvirate. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've made a number of trips, both long and short trips, to England to, to work in the collection. Is that right? Do you I have any have. idea how many trips you've oh, made there? Oh, no, 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 no. No, it's been recently as many as four times a year, uh -huh. uh, at, at least two or, two or three times a year. That takes me back maybe to talking a bit about the grants that I've won. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I certainly could not have done that without financial support. Mm -hmm. So my first, uh, I've got some notes on that. My first, um, of course, we talked about the NEH summer stipend mm -hmm. um, and the James Steele Fellowship at the University of Kentucky. But I've had 10 external grants altogether. That means I've, I've had um, 10 financial awards not made by the college. Mm -hmm. And I've had um, two major full-year um, fellowships from the NEH. Which is the National Endowment for the Humanities. National Endowment for the Humanities, right. mm -hmm. that's right. They've given me two uh, fellowships and uh, for, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars because you need that much to travel, especially when you live. I mean, I was on sabbatical for both of them. And I, I lived in Maidstone for six months, mm -hmm. and so the NEH helped support that, as well as for air travel and all that. I've also had three awards from the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, which was founded by Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'm, I'm particularly <laughs> pleased about that because I think that's a lot to get from from, from one, one small uh, agency yes. like that. And I've, I've had some other um, small grants, some from um, the another summer stipend from the NEH, and grants from the Newberry Library in Chicago, a couple of grants from the Huntington Library in uh, near Los Angeles in San Marino, California, because they have next to the um, Sh F Folger Shakespeare Library, they probably have the best collection of 16th and 17th century manuscripts and mm -hmm. rare books in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've probably told everybody far and more than and support from Mars Hill. Mm -hmm. you've, you've oh, I have. A lot of I must definitely have. Mars yes, Hill. I've had some. I've had some um, Mellon grants from mm -hmm. Mars Hill. I've had some other ACA grants that I got because I teach at Mars Hill. Mm -hmm. Mars Hill has been very generous to me. I mean, for instance, um, I think I overlooked the fact that um, Mars Hill gave me two years of leave to complete my PhD. Oh, I was on leave for uh, two full years in Chapel Hill. And, and they, they, the, the college supported that financially. Mm -hmm. I could, obviously could not have done it. Okay. And that was before we had Appalachian yeah. College Association. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I've paid them back. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The college back right. for all these years. Right. <laughs> so you've done all of this wonderful research and publishing at the same time that you've been teaching. At, have you ever seen any, what, what is the chorus, what is the connection in, yeah. in between your research and your teaching, or, or is there an overt connection? Well, yeah, the, the, there really is. I mean, I think, I think anybody who engages in scholarship and research would just see it as rejuvenating, mm -hmm. as, as vivifying. I mean, it mm -hmm. sort of keeps you alive. Right. Um, and it, even, even in practical matters, like continuing to hone my research skills and my uh, the skills at writing, doing scholarly writing, I mean, it, clearly that's going to help me in English 112 mm -hmm. and my major courses. But in my literature courses, I think I could also say that it's helped me understand the context, the cultural context mm -hmm. of the period a, a lot better. And I think I understand the cultural context of the, uh, of the period a lot better than some people who talk about the context of the period. Because I think too many ca in too many cases, when modern scholars talk about the context of early modern literature, they haven't engaged in archival research. And what they're really doing, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, is imposing a 21st or 20th century ideological perspective. They sort of read back uh -huh. into the period, and they impose an ideological perspective uh -huh. on that literature that I don't think is always mm -hmm. accurate or valid. But when you do the archival research, I mean, particularly with respect to women's roles, mm -hmm. um, it's you really are getting complex. primary sources yeah. there. You're, I mean, you're, mm -hmm. Yes, you read these letters, mm -hmm. you know exactly what exactly happened, what, mm -hmm. what they said to one another, how there was um, this companionate marriage. I mean, I have actually brought with me this one interesting quotation from one of Robert Sidney's letters. Where he, began, he always addresses the letters, sweetheart. At the end, he never fails to say, kiss my little ones for me. He uh -huh. always asked about the children. Mm -hmm. They had a very close marriage. Mm -hmm. It's clear from these letters. It's clear from what we know about um, the circumstances of their marriage as well. Mm -hmm. And I was just reading a book recently in which uh, someone else acknowledged that this is far more... I, I, I should stop and acknowledge that, of course, this was not the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Men were still positions of, uh, held positions of authority in the household. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there were frequent instances of companionate marriages, marriages of love. John Donne is another good example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John Donne was arrested and put in jail because he dared to marry uh, the, the woman he loved. So uh, Robert Sidney's letters are very affectionate. Even though I said earlier that there were times when it's clear from what he says that there were arguments, mm -hmm. He was able to acknowledge he was wrong, mm -hmm. and besides, he gave her all this responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you don't mm -hmm. give a wife so much responsibility if you don't trust her, right. <laughs> and believe that she can and do the job. Yeah, I believe she can do the job exactly. So, in one of his letters, I, this is double-edged. That's one reason I think it's so interesting. He says he begins by saying, "Sweetheart, I would not for anything that the ill husbands at the court should know how fond I am grown to send you on this fashion the first dainties I can come by." 
Now, I think what's interesting about that is, is that he's acknowledging the dominant culture of the period, which is that marriage is no excuse for not loving. In other words, not all marriages were based on love, mm -hmm. and he knew mm -hmm. that that was the case. So he didn't broadcast it. Exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, he's acknowledging he loved his wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Very that's remarkable. Yes. I've never seen that, you know, <laughs> in some of these books that insist, you know, that mm -hmm. that women. And besides, just I mean, look at Mary Sidney Herbert. She published her work. Mm -hmm. She printed her work. Mm -hmm. So, to a degree, um, I think people. Have, it's it's a more complex situation than, than we than tend many to people think of really. it. Mm -hmm. It's beginning to change. But I think for, for many years in the 90s, especially 80s and 90s, people just weren't, weren't aware mm -hmm. of how complex women's roles are, of how many women wrote and published during the period. Mm -hmm. and, partly, and were read. And were read, mm -hmm. exactly. By all means, there were multiple editions of Mary Sidney's published works, mm -hmm. multiple editions. In the 16th century or 17th century, you don't publish something again if it doesn't sell. If it's not selling. You can't afford to. Right, right. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Hope I didn't get too worked up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting indeed. And As you can, I'm glad that, to know sort of what you're passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sort of answers part of your question about why I'm able to continue doing right, this. Right, exactly. Because you really, really do <laughs> oh, I love believe it. it's that it's a labor of love. Yes, it really is. Sure. It definitely is a labor of love. Very but good. it keeps me it keeps me fresh and keeps me vital and keeps me active in the classroom, mm -hmm. I think. Good. <laughs> good. Well, getting back to the classroom and the and the and the department, um, Tell us about, over the years that you've been here, some of the departmental programs um, that, either curricular or extracurricular, that you think have defined this department or this college as, as something special. What are some of the programs? Well, um, certainly the use of the computers. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's, that's the, the fact that we now have uh, mm -hmm. computer spaces into which I teach our, in which we can teach our composition courses. I think it's just absolutely essential. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most important change that has occurred. But um, some things like um, Sigma Tau Delta. And what is Sigma is Tau the, Delta? That's the International English Honor Society. It has precedence, in mm -hmm. a sense, because the, when I first came, there was something called the Scribblerist Club, mm -hmm. which was a, a club for English majors that um, focused mainly at that time on student writing and when you met, when the students met with the faculty, the faculty members were always there, um, there was discussion of student writing but also reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we now have um, Sigma Tau Delta, um, which was, our, our chapter was um, organized in 1989. Mm -hmm. And that year, Michelle Harrison, was president. She's now Michelle Harrison Lorsey. And she was such a, a good leader, and such a responsible leader, and such a such a um, energetic leader that she was able to organize so many activities for our what do we call it? The Zeta Omega chapter of Sigma mm -hmm. Tau Delta. Mm -hmm. That our chapter won the new chapter of the year mm -hmm. in the world in 1989, 1990. Mm -hmm. And you were the advisor for that. I was the advisor for mm -hmm. that, right, right. I think it was a major achievement for mm -hmm. that uh, student group. Um, it's now being revived by um, Ali um, Andrew Jeski, mm -hmm. and it's being sponsored by um, Joanna Pierce, being advised by Joanna Pierce. But uh, one of the, our student publication also goes back mm -hmm. to uh, to, I think something called the, Scri the Scribbler that was associated with the Scribblers Club at the time. And that's Cadenza. Mm -hmm. And Cadenza is the campus um, arts magazine, not just literary magazine, but arts magazine because it's also sponsored by the art department as well as the English department. But that was begun in 1966. I just saw That was a the copy year you came? It. That was the first year I came. Okay. It was, Fred Bentley's first year, so in many ways that was a momentous year. Um, and the, all the issues, at least one copy of each issue, is in the Appalachian Collection. I was really glad to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also being revived. You're helping revive that now. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, um, getting back to the high quality it was when Betty Hughes, for instance, was uh, advisor to that. Pat Verhulst was also advisor, and Hal McDonald was advisor. I was advisor for a time. Mm -hmm. 
of uh, Cadenza. But uh, we hope that maybe we can include some images of that mm -hmm. yes. at some point. I think we'll look for some. Um, also, um, I, I wasn't as directly involved in this as you yourself were, actually. But uh, another really important program that, that again, put Mars Hill on the cutting edge, in a sense, was our preceptor program. Mm -hmm. um, you really should be saying more about this, but I'll say what I know, and then you can fill in. I, I think it was actually started by Kay Gregory. I know that she was an early uh, director of the program. And this was a program by which um, current students, uh, English majors mainly, not exclusively, English majors helped teach students who needed developmental uh, English, who needed basic English, who were in English 101. And um, at the time, the preceptors had their own groups of students, and they actually taught them and were responsible, to, to some extent, mm -hmm. for helping them uh, develop their writing skills. Um, and some of those preceptors got um, assistantships, financial aid, and graduate school based on their experience as teachers in the preceptor program. Mm -hmm. We don't use it quite to that extent anymore. Um, I think the preceptors now are used mainly as tutors in the writing center, but uh, what else could you add well, along it, those lines? It, I, when I first came here, it was the program I came to to right. work on. You were the director, right? After and Kay um, right, I yeah. took it over from Kay Gregory, and it really yeah. was a very innovative program, uh, very well conceived, I think. And um, the the preceptors weren't just put in the class without help; they had a lot of yes, assistance right. and yeah, a lot no. of supervision yeah, and so forth. But everybody knows that the best way to learn to do something is to teach someone else to do it. And so yeah. not only yeah. was it helping the basic writing students, but it was helping the preceptors. Mm -hmm. and, and we had some very strong students who did indeed become, it went on and I think used that experience in their graduate study or in teaching mm -hmm. and so forth. So yes, and, and it has evolved. It's, as you say, it's not, we're not, we don't do it exactly like that, but it is a, a fairly innovative program and has been very very helpful over the years, I right. think. Yeah. Yes, I, I quite agree. What about the English Scholarship Program? Because you've yeah. had you've had a mm -hmm. hand in that. Yes, um, I helped establish the Betty Hughes English Education Scholarship because I saw it as a way of recruiting students. Its its primary intention is to recruit first-year students who are interested in teaching in the public schools. So these are students who will eventually major in English education. And uh, we have, with her help, we've raised um, enough money to actually consider it an endowed scholarship now. Mm -hmm. We didn't award one this year because, because of the market, uh, but, um, but I, think, I, I think it's important. I think. Um, mm -hmm. It will help us, if not recruit students, keep some maybe. And it's a, it's a great honor to her because she was um, she taught for many years. The, mm -hmm. she, she directed the English education Edu program. Mm -hmm. She taught methods right. and right. supervised the students and the public schools, which is what you're mm -hmm. doing now. Mm -hmm. But she did that for many years, and so I saw it also partly as a tribute to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, in addition to all the teaching and everything else that you've done, you've also been the chair of the department. In fact, you're chair of the department now. So, yeah. how would you rate uh, administration <laughs> along with all of these other activities? And I'd things? rather teach a double overload. <laughs> than I'd rather teach. I, I, I'd, I'd rather grade uh, papers. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, I'd be almost be willing to make a deal of reading my colleagues' <laughs> uh, papers than to be chair of the department. Yes. But, uh, but I've done it, and. You do a very good job I of it, by the way. It's it's your your willingness, of <laughs> attention to detail, and yeah. and being very well organized yeah. that has really helped us in many ways. I'm willing to do it if people think I'm needed, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not my first choice. Um, but um, I think something interesting about um, our department and uh, chairs is that um, Betty Hughes. The reason I became department chair is that she became division chair, mm -hmm. uh, uh, chair of the humanities division. And then um, two other uh, chairs of the English department have also become 
chairs of the humanities division, you and um, Jason Pierce. And I think that says a lot about the quality of leadership in our department. <laughs> So. Or at least we're willing to take on a job. Well, yeah, but both of you have done a, a fine job, a much better job than I have as a department chair, which I don't like. Well, um, I guess in, in terms of, of wrapping up our conversation mm -hmm. here, um, tell me what you think. You've had now 43, 44 years at Mars Hill. So you probably better than anyone can say, what, what do you think the characteristics are of Mars Hill that are special, either to students or to faculty, to the whole community? But what are some of the things that you think are really special? Well, I, I think it, it really goes back to the small size. And I know you can say that about any small college. But uh, <clears throat> I think particularly in our department, other departments too, but um, um, we are able to interact with our students because of the small size of the classes, um, and I think the students benefit from that. And I like working with the students individually. I like getting, and, and the students you know, frequently will acknowledge that, even when they sometimes complain about some things. They almost always will acknowledge that, that it is clear that their teachers here care about them, mm -hmm. and they are willing to interact with them. and, right. and um, <clears throat> they don't feel threatened by them by and large. <laughs> and we don't always feel threatened by our students uh, by and large <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think that's really very important. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I still like working with the kinds of students we get here. And of course, students who come here are students who usually want to come to a small college. Mm -hmm. If they've not come for something else, <laughs> if they've come for an education, then they recognize the value of that. Mm -hmm. So. So the smallness itself is a kind yeah. of advantage. Yeah, right. I really think so. Right. Really think well, so. it also allows students to have opportunity to do things like cadenza yes. and so forth. Yes, exactly. Very, very good point. It gives them opportunities to, um, to develop leadership skills mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and to take other kinds of risks. Um, you yourself have pointed that out, that they can um, get involved in, in other kinds of activities or take um, different kinds of classes. Um, Mm -hmm. that uh, or in, be engaged in organizations that they might not feel so um, free to do and are comfortable doing in larger colleges. Mm -hmm. And then of course they get they, they know the whole student body almost mm -hmm. and that can make a difference. Right, so. right. So of all the changes that we've had mm -hmm. in the last 40 plus years, the size really isn't one of them. That's we've, true. Been, we've been bigger, oh, but uh, yeah. but <laughs> staying small is kind of part of I our identity it, and yeah. I mean, just go back to the fact that we can teach our composition classes in the computer classroom. In a, compl in a computer yeah, classroom. So, no, I think, right. I think, yeah, there are definite advantages. I think there always will be. Mm -hmm. What do I know about <laughs> it? But I, I, no, I, I think there will always be a place for a small college. Well, I hope yeah. so. Yeah. And, um, well... I'd like to, also like to say something about the faculty, too. Because okay. I, mean, I think the, um, the English department faculty especially, um, I think we have gotten to a point now that we've sort of been heading toward for many years. We have a lot of members of the English department now who are, who, who also like the fact that it's a small college, like the advantage that mm -hmm. comes from the small college being closely involved with the students, interacting with the students, getting to know the students very well. And um, you're good at that, and especially, the, well, our new members of the department of Pearson, I think, are very good about that, too. And, um, and I think um, we also now have really high standards as a department as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not always been the case. And I think that that combination of being able to work really well individually with the students and letting the students uh, know and, and sort of be listening to <laughs> these students, the acknowledgement that they know we have their best uh, interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being able to have high standards and um, is, is very important. Right. And I so think close relationship, but also demanding a lot yeah, of our students is yeah, kind of a key. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And being okay. firm, but also um, kindly. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. I, mean, I, I enjoy that more and more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whenever you took the job in 1966, would you have ever guessed that you were going to make your career here and write six books and oh, do all these wonderful things? 
I don't think I thought anything about anything at the time. I mean, just that one young, day at a time. Just came out of graduate school. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. one year older than um, a college senior. No, I, I, yes. I wouldn't have expected any of this at all. Mm -hmm. I knew I just wanted to go into college teaching. You knew you wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> and you, a you've been that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot better teacher. You're than a lot better teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certainly glad to have that to have met you here and to have been able to have the honor of working with you for, what, 22, 23 years, and hopefully it'll go on. So thank you much, and congratulations on your long and productive career, Marcel. Well, thanks. I can say the same to you. Thank you very much. Circle Award. First of all, Noel is a master teacher. Although he appears to be very quiet and unassuming, he is a dynamic, enthusiastic, and creative teacher. As a former student said of him, Dr. Kinneman has an incredible ability to make a subject enjoyable. <clears throat> and his enthusiasm does not end with the subject matter. He is excited about his students and their prospects for success, unquote. Noel has an uncanny ability to bring out the best in all of his students. He also encourages intellectual depth and seriousness in learning. Noel is also a brilliant scholar. He is already widely recognized and respected for his research and published articles and with the anticipated publication by Oxford Press of a critical edition of the works of Mary Sidney Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, in the near future, his reputation as a learned scholar will be unquestioned. Noel has been awarded on our campus as the Gibbs Outstanding Teacher. He's also been awarded uh, the title Master Teacher by the Appalachian College Program of the University of Kentucky and has been recognized as an outstanding teacher by one of the recent senior classes, to name only a few of his honors. <coughs> but there are many other sides to Noel besides his reputation as a scholar teacher. He does so much for so many people in his own quiet, unheralded way. He is the unofficial editor of many of the publications produced on campus, such as Self Studies, the college catalog and others. He volunteers his time as organist at Mars Hill Methodist Church and works in other capacities as well. Noel is one of the most generous, thoughtful, and accommodating people I know. There's so much more that I could say, but I simply conclude by saying that Noel Kinneman is my dear friend. And this Golden Circle Award is being presented to Dr. Noel Kenneman for having made a significant difference to that idea and vision which is Mars Hill College. Congratulations. Congratulations.